Well, many of you, or at least many people you associate with, are out fighting through stampedes of people trying to save $10 on the latest Fruit of the Loom underoos. I'm over here slaving away trying to keep you up to date on Nintendo news, or at least as up to date as I can, even if I have to babysit my super cute niece just so my sister can join the millions. <laughs> Fighting for that $10 doorbuster deal, they just can't wait a few months from now to become the standard price. I get it. I just bought myself some eShop gift cards for a 10% off discount at Target online just so I can give them away during our Game Awards special on December 7th. So, well, I guess I'm just as guilty as everyone else. Except, I didn't have to leave my home. <clears throat> Today, we have a former employee of Platinum Games sounding off on a bunch of future or potential future games that would assuredly release on Nintendo Switch or even Nintendo Switch 2. And so much sales data, it will make your eyes bleed red. Well, okay, maybe that's not a good thing. Anyways, there's also a Ganondorf appearance that's a total simp fodder. Or is it really fodder if we're just simping that hard for Ganondorf? Whatever, that and more here. So, first, let's talk about Hideki Kamiya, the now former director and producer of a bunch of Platinum Games' most well-known and successful franchises. For those unaware, Hideki Kamiya recently left the company in October, and it's interesting because he actually co-founded Platinum Games in 2006. Yeah, he was that big of a deal there. He did not give a reason for leaving, nor did Platinum Games press release on the situation, and if I had to guess, it seems somewhat tenuous. Current president of Platinum Games, Atsuchi Inaba, literally stated back in February of 2022 that he wouldn't dismiss acquisition offers for the company, the first indication that Platinum Games could potentially be bought by another company. I would argue this doesn't really matter for Kamiya if it wasn't for the fact he has stated on social media in years past that he never wants Platinum Games to be bought by another big company. Is this the impasse that led to him leaving the company he founded? Who knows? But if one thing is true of Kamiya, it's that we'll probably hear him rant about it at some point in the future once whatever NDA he's under after leaving the company expires. That being said, he recently conducted an interview that gave us a lot of details on some of the biggest games Platinum Games has to offer, including many games beloved by Nintendo fans. And more, beyond Platinum as well. Future games, perhaps. For starters, let's dive into Bayonetta. Now remember, he wasn't the director of Bayonetta 3, but he was still in the credits and yes, had involvement in the project. Kamiya is the creator of the IP itself. So he had this to say on the future of Bayonetta. As I explained earlier, I worked on Bayonetta 1, 2, 3, and Origins. I've talked about this in various interviews, that the Bayonetta series would consist of a total of nine episodes, and that I wanted to grow the franchise as the Bayonetta saga. But it seems like I may have to take the full saga to the grave with me. It's a shame. It's not like I own the Bayonetta IP, but I suppose those who do will probably keep it going. Naturally, he was indicating he had an entire roadmap of nine titles for Bayonetta herself and potentially ideas for a lot of spinoffs that will never be fully realized. He also seems quite upset about it, indicating even more that whatever the reason was that he left the company, it probably wasn't amicably. That being said, he did say he thinks the series will continue, so maybe that indicates Nintendo has already ordered a Bayonetta 4 for Nintendo Switch 2. Only time will tell. Of course, now that Hideki Kamiya is a free agent and no longer part of Platinum Games, he has other options he would love to pursue if given the opportunity. There's no doubt that for however crass Kamiya can be, he certainly is a brilliant video game creator. He was an original planner and designer for the very first Resident Evil game, and he was the actual director of a now classic IP known as Devil May Cry. We know about the escapades at Platinum Games all too well with Bayonetta, The Wonderful 101, Star Fox Zero, and yes, Scalebound, right up until Microsoft pulled the plug on that. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of mad about that one. But before all of that, he also created Beautiful Joe and Okami. And now he's hoping his connections with Capcom will gain him the ability to revisit these IPs yet again. Here's what he had to say in this interview. Of course, I'd love to work on them if I ever get the chance. I actually had the story for a third Beautiful Joe all thought out. I've always wanted to make it. I wonder if Capcom would let me make another Beautiful Joe. Okami too. I felt like I left that unfinished. So if we could make that happen as well, I'd be happy. Now, technically those games did get other sequels in Beautiful Joe Red Hot and the DS exclusives Beautiful Joe Double Trouble and Okamadin. But Kamiya was not involved in any of those projects and they are not considered even close to the same quality as the first two Beautiful Joe games and the original Okami. As such, a third and second title, respectfully, from his creative vision, would be a welcome addition. And yes, these games were fairly popular on Nintendo's old platforms. Of course, he is a free agent now running a YouTube channel and doing these interviews, but he clearly wants to hook up with Capcom yet again. And that's where his career first began oh so long ago with Resident Evil. Only time will tell if they hire him back or at least let him work on select IP as an independent contractor. You know, kind of like Masahiro Sakurai. You can also independently hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And yes, go ahead and tap away on the like button because if you're still watching, clearly you're enjoying what you've heard so far, right? And if you aren't, why the hell are you here? Did you lose a bet? Well, be glad. Because there are worse things in life than having to suffer through this video. Seriously, have you tried tuna eyeballs? Be glad that wasn't your punishment. Next, we need to talk about something interesting with Super Mario RPG. A game I'm finally picking up today and I'm so excited to play. Now, here's the thing. Way back in the day, with its original release on the Super Nintendo, there was a cheat code that was only available in the Japanese version of the game. The cheat code is special, all right? And now we could fully rejoice as this exclusive cheat code is now available to use worldwide on the Switch version of the game. So what does it do? After all, it's been elusive for nearly 30 years. Well, when you're on the menu screen in the game, do the following on your controller. Press down, then up, then right, left, L, R, L, R, B. Though, if you want to be a little tricky, you can swap the L and R for ZL and ZR, because, you know, that's fun. And bam, the game will let you know that you have found a secret code. Unbelievable! Now you're a Super Mario RPG master! Lucky you. For your efforts, you're rewarded with... Absolutely nothing. Okay, sort of a lie. Technically, you get a bonus conversation with Toad himself. Not only does he tell you that you found a secret code, he will also check all your stats just for fun and then say, I'll level with you. There aren't any other codes, and this one will do the same thing every time. That's right. The cheat code just leads to Toad trolling you that something magical is about to happen right before Toad confesses this isn't going to do anything, and the code is practically useless. Exclusive to Japan in the original release, the code was put in there to troll people who were commonly using cheat codes back in the day. We now get to experience Toad's savagery worldwide this time around. Next, sales are in for the launch of Super Mario RPG in Japan, and it didn't exactly move the needle like many may have hoped for a holiday title. It did come in at number two, moving 301,334 units. Now, this is just physical, and sales weren't tracked for the original release, so we have no way of knowing how this really compares, but it lost out to another new game this week from Konami called Momoyaro Dentetsu World. Okay, I'm just going to leave it at that because admittedly, I can barely pronounce my own name. Either way, this is a Switch game as well, and it moved 314,699 units as a new release last week. Wonder chimes in at number 3, moving 50,000 units and finally crossing 1 million in sales in Japan alone. The Switch version of Hogwarts Legacy comes in at number 4 as a new release at 47,717 units sold, with another new release in Persona 5 Tactica for Switch, landing at number 5 with 26,794 units. 
Now, even though Super Mario RPG didn't blow the socks off the charts and easily claim number one, there were a lot of really good performing brand new Switch games last week. So naturally, the Nintendo Switch saw a huge bump in sales, right? Well, collectively, the Nintendo Switch was the overall bestseller in Japan last week with just over 66,000 units sold compared to PlayStation 5 at nearly 63,000 units, though the base PlayStation 5 was the best overall individual system selling. But I noted with all these new releases, Switch sort of saw a big boost in sales, but the data suggests otherwise. The week before, the Nintendo Switch collectively sold 64,000 units, and that's essentially what it's been selling the entire last six weeks. While these sales aren't anything to scoff at in Japan, it is down over the last month, year over year, for this time of year, falling in line with Nintendo's own projections that this holiday season, they certainly felt they would sell a lot less than last year, which is why they have projected to sell less systems this fiscal year than the last despite being ahead in the first two quarters. Nintendo actually gets a majority of their sales during the holiday season when it comes to system sales. But I wouldn't get all gloomy. Nintendo already predicted this decline, and 15 million is still an absolutely incredible number to do in year seven. That's right in line with year one in 2017. Nintendo has a plan, and we'll just have to wait for it to play out. Of course, we want to end the day with something positive, you know, positive thinking, right? Especially for you tired shoppers out there that were busy fighting off other people just for the last pack of gum at checkout after a long day of uh, savings, I guess. Nintendo dropped images of a brand new Tears of the Kingdom statue to go along with the beautiful Link statue they used to market the game before launch. This time, it's Ganondorf in all of his simp glory. I mean evil intended posing. It's really quite glorious to behold, and I do truly wonder why they added this statue so long after the game came out. But it was used as a marketing event in Japan, showing Nintendo is indeed still doing a rather strong push for Tears of the Kingdom. And now that's not really that surprising given it's the runaway best-selling game for them this year, having moved over 20 million copies after today. I tried asking Doug Bowser on the phone how much it would cost to get the Ganondorf statue in my home because, hey, I'd like it to be a permanent part of a new set I want to build. Unfortunately, he gave me the classic, if you have to ask, you can afford it line. And no truer words have probably ever been spoken. Something like this is truly priceless and will likely be an eventual addition along with Link to the brand new Nintendo Museum in Japan. And no, folks, I... I, I that was sarcasm. I, I don't have Doug Bowser on speed dial. Or do I? That's going to wrap things up today. While many of you begin wrapping presents for the next month's holiday extravaganza, I hope you enjoyed the journey from start to finish in this video as much as I did. I'm going to catch all of you guys in that next video.